Bibles to the book of Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. Quick announcement over our direction. We're going to continue on with the life of Samson all the way through. But right afterwards, we're going to take a pause from sort of our biblical arc. And I'm going to do a series I wrote a, a long time ago and have constantly been revising it as God has been working through my ministry called God's Will, Nothing More, Nothing Less, Nothing Else. So I'm excited about preaching and teaching through that. It's... Uh, um, it, it started out when I was at a church in Brea, and, uh, and God just used that to, to grow into an entire series, and, uh, and I hope it's a blessing to you. So, Judges chapter 14. Let's have a little fun, shall we? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not the best at this, but I, I do sort of love to do impressions from time to time, so I'm going to do an impression for you. Let's see how well this works. Ready? You throw away the outside, you cook the inside. What you eat the outside and throw away the inside. What do you eat, process? And it, yes, it's Gollum. Thank you. <laughs> For those of you that did not get it, Pastor York has informed you. But you know, what is the answer to the riddle? What do you think? Riddle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gave you a visual clue, so hopefully you got that between the two of them. <laughs> Throw away the outside, cook the inside, then you eat the outside and throw away the inside. What do you eat? Corn. It's corn. Okay. Throw away the outside, eat, eat, eat the inside, then you throw away the inside. Very good. All right, let's do another one. Real quick, if you know it, just shout it out. What can you catch but not throw? Well, I think I heard someone say it. What is it? Cold. It's a cold. Right, you catch a cold. Right, okay. Uh, let's do one more. No, two more, sorry. I have holes on my top and bottom, my left, my right, and middle, but still hold water. What am I process? Sponge. This is sponge. Very good. All right, last one. This is my favorite one of all of them. The, the man who made it doesn't want it. The man who bought it doesn't need it. The man who needs it doesn't know it. What is it? It's a coffin. That's right. Very good. It's a coffin. Because if you, if you made it, it's not going to be for you, right? The man who bought it is probably buying it for a loved one. And the man who needs it is already dead. <laughs> right? Riddles can be fun. But one of the things, and especially why I chose to use uh, the Lord of the Rings as a backdrop, well, actually the Hobbit for this one, and the riddle exchange between Gollum and between uh, Bilbo is because I love what J.R.R. Tolkien did um, in the Lord of the Rings when, um, when uh, Bilbo, or sorry, when Frodo and Gandalf are talking in the mines of Moria. Um, they, they realize that, Gan that uh, Gollum is already following them. And, and Bilbo said, it is a pity that Bilbo didn't kill him, that didn't, he didn't finish him off when he had the chance. And Gandalf says, well, wait a minute, it was pity that stayed his hand. Bilbo wasn't supposed to kill him. And Gandalf says this very, very important thing, this key that you need to understand in order to understand the entire message of Samson, and that is this. Gandalf says... I believe Gollum still has some part to play. Yeah. I believe Gollum has some part to play. Wherever you are in your life and wherever you are in your Christian journey, you might be in a position where you think, yeah, I'm growing in Christ. I'm, I'm developing my relationship with him. Awesome. That's, that's so wonderful. And, and, and praise the Lord that you are. You have a part to play. But maybe some of you here are still wrestling with your walk with God. You're struggling about your relationship with him. You don't know what it is that God wants you to do. You question whether or not maybe that God could even use you. You still have some part to play. And I know, I know that there are a lot of people that you're going to look at in your life and you're going to come across some Christians that you really think are... are are they a Christian? You may even run across some pastors that you'll wonder, how can this guy ever call himself a pastor? 
And I'll tell you, me and my family, we have dealt with this in, in the worst of ways, where the people who have hurt us the most have come from the church. And even those that hurt us deeply still have some part to play. My parents and I, and, and, and you may hear me reference this story again sometime later. My parents and I all went to the same church with my brother when we were growing up called First Baptist Church of La Mirada. I grew up in that church. I was baptized in, in that church when I was 12. The pastor of that church married my parents, Pastor Robert Hayes. Okay? It was a huge part of our family. But then Pastor Hakes retired. He got shingles. He couldn't serve as pastor anymore. We got a new pastor, a pastor by the name of Mike Bowers. And that pastor, when he took over the church, he decided to look over that church and he saw people in the church that he didn't want to be a part of the church anymore. He found them as undesirable. How can a pastor ever look at a person and consider that person to be undesirable? But he did. And he found that they all congregated around this one program called Awana. And he decided to kill off Awana so that those people would leave and that he could recreate the church. Now, I was a sophomore in high school at the time. There was no other program for high schoolers other than our Awana program. We didn't have a Sunday school for high school because the two high school that came to church every Sunday, my best friend and I, we taught second grade Sunday school. So there was nothing for us except to wanna. And he decided to destroy the program. My dad went in in order to talk to him and say, hey, you know, if you do that, you're not providing any ministry for my son. If you provide no ministry for my son, we can't stay at this church. And the pastor effectively said to my father, well, then don't let the door hit you on your way out. In fact, he not only just let us go, but he called the local churches in the area, warning them about my family, saying that if we went to their church, we would destroy their church like we were destroying his church. We had to go clear out to Brea in order to find a church that wasn't under his influence that would allow us to go and do more than just sit in pews, but could actually let us serve and be a part of that church. What a jerk, right? How horrible can you be? And this man is a pastor. But even he has a part to play. We may not know what our part is, but God still has something he wants to do with you. We may not understand exactly where God is leading us, but I promise you that the circumstances you're facing right now are doing something in your life, just like they're doing something in the life of Samson. So in your Bibles, let's read together Judges chapter 14. It's a short chapter, only 20 verses. And let's look at what God was doing in the life of Samson. Samson went down to Timnah. At Timnah, he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now get her for me as a wife. But his father and mother said to him, is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or, or among our, all our people that you must go to take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. His father and his mother did not know that it was from the Lord, for he was seeking an opportunity against the Philistines. And that, at that time, the Philistines ruled over Israel. Then Samson went down with his father and mother to Timnah, and they came to the vineyards of Timnah, and behold, a young lion came toward him, roaring. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and although he had nothing in his hand, he tore the lion in pieces as one tears a young goat. But he did not tell his father or his mother what he had done. Then he went down and he talked with the woman and she was right in Samson's eyes. After some days, he returned to take her and he turned aside 
to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion and honey. He scraped it out with his hands, went on eating it as he went. And then he came to his father and his mother and he gave some to them and they ate. But he did not tell them he had scraped the honey from the carcass of a lion. His father went down to the woman. The Samson prepared the feast there, for so the young men used to do. And as soon as the people saw him, they brought 30 companions to be with him. And Samson said to them, let me now put a riddle. If you can tell me what it is within the seven days of the feast, I will find uh, and find it out. Then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 undergarments. Okay, but if you cannot tell me what it is, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 undergarments. And they said to him, put your riddle that we may hear it. And he said to them, out of the eater came something to eat. And out of the strong came something sweet. And in three days, they could not solve the riddle. On the fourth day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband to tell us what the riddle is, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us here to impoverish us? And Samson's wife wept over him and said, you only hate me and you do not love me. And then you have put a riddle to my people and you haven't told me what it is. And he said to her, behold, I have not told my father nor my mother. Shall I tell you? She wept before him for the rest of the seven days that their feast lasted. And on the seventh day, he finally told her because she had pressed him hard. Then she told the riddle to her people and the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, what is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? And he said to them, if you had not plowed with my heifer, nice thing to call your wife, you would not have found out my riddle. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him and he went down to Ashkelon, struck down 30 men of the town, took their spoil, gave the garments to those he had told the riddle. In hot anger, he went to his father's house. And Samson's wife was given to his companion who had been his best man. Some really hard things are happening in this passage. Why is this passage designed for us? How can this passage help instruct and teach us? The passage begins with Samson going down and seeing this woman. She was hot. That was the whole point. Right? She was fine in his eyes. That's what it means when it says he was straight to her. He was exactly what he wanted in a wife. She was. Mm. So he decides he wants to marry her. Now, I want you to know that if I ever treated my parents this way, my dad would have pulled me aside and said, look, boy, I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Okay, look at what Samson says to his own parents. Woman, I have seen in Timnah, but now you must proceed to take with her to me to wife. Samson says to his own parents, dang, I found this woman. You make me marry her. Which means now the job of the dad is to go in and arrange some dowry in order to be able to make sure that woman can marry his son. If it was the other way around, if the daughter was like, ooh, ooh, we really want to marry Samson, then the dowry would go to Samson and his parents. But it's Samson who desires it. And so Samson uh, goes to his dad and says, you've got to shell out some money because I want that woman and I want that woman to be my wife. Now, the father does what a good father should have done in this situation, but it's not really that strong to Samson. He says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, wait a minute, there's nothing, no one in all my people that you can be able to marry? No one that you find suitable in order to be a wife? That you have to go over to the Philistines, to the uncircumcised? 
That is key for what is happening here. See, in Deuteronomy, it says that the children of Israel were not to intermarry with the children of the Canaanite. Why? Not because of racism, not because the, you know, the Israelites had to have some pure bloodline. That's ridiculous. It was because of their faith. They weren't circumcised. They were not children of the promise. They did not follow God Yahweh. They followed other pagan gods like Dagon. So no way. They were supposed to marry children who believed the same way. That is a wise principle for us to follow. Because if you marry someone of a different faith, unless that person is willing to convert, you're automatically, spiritually, going to be heading in two different directions. How then can you grow, grow closer to each other? You've got to find someone with at least the same faith. And I would even argue you also need to find someone with the same values. If they value different things, you're going to have a very, very hard time. Because you're going to be headed in different directions. Governed by your faith and governed by your values. Can't you find someone in all the children of Israel? And he says, nope. You have got to get her. Why? Because she is straight in my eyes. She is hot. She is fine. She is exactly what I want. He knows nothing about her other than she is pretty. Gentlemen, that is a bad criteria for a wife. There are a lot of really hot women. And they are not going to make good wives. And there are a lot of women that will make wonderful wives. And let's face it, they're not the hottest women on the planet. What do you want? Looks that's only going to last another 20, 30 years. Or a relationship that is going to be valuable to you for the rest of your life. There are a lot of men that make bad decisions about whom they're going to marry because they have the wrong criteria. They're looking for looks. Samson was looking for looks. You got to get her. I want her. It's got to be her. The outside was great. The inside, yeah, not so much. And Samson... Look at what he's doing. And my son ever went to me and was like, Dad, I want her. I don't know how it's going to work, but you have to get me to marry her. I'd be like, you want to try that again? <laughs> Even if I lived in a culture where, where it was actually an arranged marriage, I'd be like, what? Uh, no. That's not how it works, boy. Right? No way. Uh-uh. Samson is spoiled. He is a spoiled, rotten jerk. But what the parents did not know was that God was using this spoiled man to do his bidding. It says in verse 4, but the parents had no idea that Samson still had a role to play in God's plan. He had no idea what was going on. People sort of expected, I would have expected, as someone who is a Nazarite from birth, someone who is growing up to be dedicated specifically to God, would at least have a more godly character with his parents. But not Samson. He stinks. So what is God doing? How in the world can God take someone like that, someone like Samson, and still use him? still turn him into one of the greatest judges in the book of Judges, a hero in God's faith hall of fame in Hebrews 11. What in the world is God going to do? The problem with Samson, and I know, young people, you're not going to like me for saying this. The problem with Samson is that he doesn't have enough vitamin N in his diet. Now, you might be saying, what? Vitamin N? Yeah, Vitamin no. <laughs> Sometimes your parents have got to say no to you. Sometimes they have to tell you, especially in their wisdom, because God placed them in charge of your life, 
No, we're not going to do that. No, I'm sorry. That's not the best idea. No, you cannot do that. No. Now, some parents are really good at vitamin N because that's all they give their kids. No, 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 no. Let me, t- let me tell you a little story about a man named No. If you want to know the answer to your question, go to www.no.com. Right? They constantly just want to say no, 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 no. Now, parents, I do want to tell you there has to be some form of balance. Don't go to the extreme and say, well, pastor said I should give you more no in your diet. So nope, 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 no. Right? That's not, that's not it either. It's not only no. I have a rule that I try to follow, and that is this. If I have a good reason, then I will say no to my children. If I don't have a good reason, then I either need to come up with a good reason fast, or we need to figure out a way that we can work it out. Okay? That's usually my rule of thumb. But my kids will tell you from time to time, I will tell them no. And my wife will say, not enough. Okay? We've got to give them more no, probably, than yes. And, parents, it is okay for you to say, if you, they, if you say no, and they say to you, why? To use my mom's best answer, because I said so. <laughs> You're the parent. They're the child. They don't always need to know why. Because sometimes the why is just a prelude for a fight. They want to argue. And if that's the case, tell them no. And say, I'm simply the authority. No means no. Okay? But from time to time, do encourage them with a yes or two. Samson probably got only yes. Because he was the only child of parents in their old age. And so the dad spoiled him. Anything you wanted, it's yours, because you're my boy. And so he raised a brat. He raised a spoiled brat. And Samson now has this woman that he wants. Why is God letting all this stuff happen? A couple things. One. God uses circumstances in order to move us into the right place. When my family left First Baptist Church of La Mirada and we went clear out to Brea, we went to a church that loved us, that welcomed us. Pastor David Rader was phenomenal with us. He helped me at a very critical time in my life because I was on the verge of becoming bitter. I hated what my previous church did to me. I was angry. And as he shared his own bad experiences with church, it allowed me to know, you know what? Life isn't perfect. It's never going to be. Everyone's going to make mistakes. I have to let go of that anger. I can't keep it inside or I'm going to be in trouble. God uses circumstances in order to move us. Because we went out to Brea, Pastor Dave Rader ended up using me like an interim pastor. That was where I first started to preach in churches. I never would have preached in First Baptist La Mirada. And God was moving me to become a pastor and using David Rader as an integral part of my training. The second thing is God uses the circumstances to change us. Samson, we're going to see, is very, very, very slow to change. But that doesn't mean the circumstances aren't there to try to mold him and shape him. The stuff that you don't like about your life, the stuff that you might even find is the hardest parts about your life. Those are the things that I have found as I've looked back at my life are the very things that God has used the most in order to shape me to who I am today. The comments that you hear from people who minister with me, who know me, who work together with me, I am that way because I've gone through some pretty rough times. And that way, because God used events in order to reform my character into what he desired. Samson is now getting moved into Timnah, into Philistine territory. He's been on the border. And for most of his life, he hasn't done anything. He hasn't done jack. He's been a Nazarite to God. Woohoo! Has he done anything about it? No. 
Has he delivered the Philistines or delivered Israel from the Philistines? No. Has he even attacked the Philistines? No. He wants to marry one. He's not doing anything. So God says, all right, let's move him to where I want him. And he places him in Timnah now for a wedding. His own wedding. On his way, while he's walking along, he gets to the outskirts of Timnah. And this would happen from time to time. Out pops a lion. And the lion attacks Samson. Now here is the amazing part. While he is wrestling with this lion... The Bible says, and this is everything that happens. The Bible says that the spirit of Yahweh proceeded to rush upon him. The spirit of Yahweh proceeded to rush upon him. The spirit of Yahweh proceeded to rush upon him. Samson is not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Samson is not this gigantic, you know, Dwayne the Rock Samson, where he just has muscles the size of his head. Right? That just this lion goes and he's like, Rawr! and he grabs the lion and starts beating the crap out of the lion. No, Samson probably looked a lot like me. And if I'm walking along the street, doo -doo 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 -doo, and some lion pops out, the first thing that comes in my mind is not, Rawr! the first thing that comes in my mind is, ah! Right? Samson is short. Probably the average size of the Jew back then was five foot three to five foot five. I would have made a good Jew. Okay? They were not very tall. The, the Canaanites were head and shoulders above him. Samson probably didn't look that muscle bound either. He was not this super stud. He was a simple Jew with long hair. A beard that he never cut. That's why some of these pictures, it's like, oh, I like the picture. But he's not like the bulging biceps and he doesn't have a shaved face like the recent movie of Samson. Cleanly shaven? No, he's a Nazarite. He's Mr. Hairball. <laughs> and he's walking along and a lion jumps out to attack him. And that's when the spirit of God rushes upon him. And that's when he could do something amazing. Samson would wear the Holy Spirit like a coat, like an armor, that whenever the Spirit rushed upon him and became his protection, he could feel his muscles surge, he could feel power in him, and he could do miraculous things. But without the Spirit, he was just another man. Without the Spirit, you and I are just like everybody else. It is only when we move in the spirit of God that wonderful things beyond our comprehension can, can happen. Like Samson tearing the lion to pieces as if he had nothing in his hands. The lion attacks and Samson's like, Rah! and the lion is half a lion because of his bare hands. Whew. Now, Samson then goes and he sees this woman. Oh, she's still a hottie. Hadn't changed much in the last, I don't know, week or so. And so he goes and he's now trying to make arrangements in order to be able to marry this woman. And they make the arrangements. They get it set. Samson is going to have this huge party in the city of Timnah in order to have his bride. The party is going to last seven days because that's how long the parties lasted. And Samson, go Samson goes home to prepare. On his way home, he royally screws up. The Bible says that he proceeded to turn aside to see the carcass of the lion. To turn aside. He's walking on the road just outside of Tim and he goes, oh yeah. I remember I was wrestling with that lion somewhere around here, around these vineyards. Oh, I think it was over there. And he turns off the path in order to go check out the carcass of the lion. Why shouldn't he do that? Because he's a Nazarite. And because the Nazarite vow would forbid him to do something like that. He, in fact, goes, sees that there's honey, honeybees in the carcass of the lion. He's not even supposed to get close to it because it's a dead body. He not only gets close, he goes into the carcass and scrapes out honey 
from the dead corpse of the lion. He walks along, eats it, and then he hands it to his parents. Why is this so bad? Because he had three vows he was supposed to keep his entire life. Three. Three things he was supposed to do. Do you remember them? What was vow number one? Don't cut your hair, right? He was never, ever supposed to cut his hair. What's vow number two? No. No drinking wine nor eating anything of the vine because you're not even supposed to get close. So no strawberries. Oh, I, that, I would suck. No grapes. Bad. No blackberries. I'm out. Right? Nothing that grows, no fruit that grows on a vine was he allowed to touch because you could use that to be fermented and turned into alcohol and he was never even supposed to get close. What's the third vow he was supposed to have? Stay away from anything that's dead. Everything that's dead. So he couldn't go near a dead animal and he couldn't go near a dead person because death is the consequence of sin. And he was supposed to act as if he was totally separate from sin. So no going near death. No going near the consequence of sin. And what did he do? He turned aside to go to sin. He was going on the path. And he thought, you know what? I think I'm going to sin. And I know we do the same thing. I know some of you are even going to do the same thing today. You're going to go home and you're going to think about something that you want to do and know it's not the best for you, but you're going to do it anyway. Samson's a brat and Samson has now willfully broken his vow and it continues. It continues because then Samson goes to the feast because thus the young men made. Wait, where is he again? What is the name of that city? Timnah. Is Timnah in the Philistine territory or is Timnah in the Jewish territory or the Israelite territory? It's in Philistines. And what do you think Philistines are going to do at a feast, especially a feast lasting seven days? They're going to drink. They're going to party. They're going to get all kinds of food, grapes, watermelons, strawberries, anything that they could find in order to make their feast delicious. Figs, dates, honey, you name it. They were going to party for seven days, which meant they were going to consume alcohol, which means if Samson is in Timnah, he is partying like the Philistines. Like how their young men made, which means what is he drinking? He turned aside to look at a corpse. He set up a party in a foreign land and he acted as the foreigners did. Samson has now broken two of his vows. He's only got one left. You think he can keep it? Well, if you know the story, it's just a matter of time. Samson is not acting like a Nazarite, is he? He's a spoiled brat. Not enough vitamin N in his diet. But God still has a purpose for him. Ha, what, what can God do with a jerk like this? God has Samson make a riddle. He says to everyone, like I treated you guys with this riddle. I'm going to make a riddle. If you guess my riddle, I'm going to give you 30 garments. I'm going to give you 30 undergarments. But if you can't guess my riddle, then you, each of you are going to give me one garment. There were 30 men. So you're going to give me a total of 30 changes of clothes. And you're going to give me a total of 30 undergarments. Do you think you can guess my riddle? And they said, heck yeah. 
Riddle me this, Samson. What is it? And so Samson gives him the riddle. From the one who eats, food has come out. And from the mighty, sweet has gone out. What he's talking about is the lion and the honey that he had stumbled upon. Okay, so maybe God can use that. Yeah, God does. But I want you to know, it's not because God wants you to sin. But it's because of the graciousness of God that God can even take mistakes that you've made and use it for his greatest glory. I was with two brothers and one I was trying to intervene with. I had never even heard the story of one of my other, of, of the, the full story of the two brothers that I was serving with at that time. But I knew one was having a really hard time. And so we all got to a brother's house and we sat and we talked with each other. And I'm not going to mention any names in order to, to, even if you happen to find out who they are way into the future, hopefully you'll never connect it. These two brothers and I sat and talked and we shared with each other and, and we spent quite a bit of time together in order to help the one. And while we were ministering to this brother who is in deep need with his life right at that time, the other brother began to share his life, even some of the mistakes, some of the sin that he had made. And God had redeemed that in such a way that now as he was sharing, this brother was getting stronger and was beginning to see light at the end of the tunnel. We often get so worried that people might know our past, our history, what I've done. Don't be. Because God can use even your past in order to strengthen other brothers and sisters with what God is doing in your life now. Amen. Now, Samson is not moving with God. God is just using this brat and using the events of this brat to continue to move him. Now, Samson gives the riddle. These guys can't figure it out for the next three days. They're like, oh, we have no idea what this is. This makes so, no sense. Out of the eater comes food? How does food come out of something that eats? They're probably guessing a bunch of stuff. It's, uh, you know... It's a this, it's a that, it's a bear, it's an antelope, it's a deer, it's a why? Well, no, 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 no. Finally, after three days of not being able to find out what this riddle is, they go to Samson's wife and they say to him, to her, hey, you got to tell us what this riddle is. You better tell us what this riddle is. If you don't tell us what this riddle is, we're going to burn your father's house down with you inside. They threatened to kill her. Now, if she is a good woman, if she is a God-fearing woman, what do you think she's going to do? She's going to go to Samson. And she's going to see Samson. These guys, they have threatened to kill me and my father. And, 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 and I don't know what to do. What, what, what am I supposed to do? And then the spirit of the Lord could rush upon Samson and he would go over to those guys and he'd beat the crap out of them and everything would be fine. But she's not a God-fearing woman. She's a Philistine. She's not moving in the same direction as Samson is. She's moving in a different direction. So she thinks to herself, why would Samson care about my father? I care about him. I care about my life too. So she goes to Samson. And she says to Samson, you hate me. No, no, baby, I love you. You hate me. Why? What's wrong? Because you didn't tell me the riddle. What? Okay, I do have to say, in defense of men everywhere, women, please, don't do this to your husbands. When you go to them, you hate me. We married you. We love you. If we didn't love you anymore, we'd be gone. Do you understand? We're still there. Now, men, we have to take a little responsibility of this too. There was one time where this husband and wife, right after their marriage, the husband said to his wife, sweetheart, I'm going to say this once. And only once. I love you. Now, you're never going to need me to say that ever again. And her response, her wise response, her husband was, but I forget sometimes. Okay, so men, we need to remind our wives. But wives, 
please don't use this as a stick to beat us with. You don't love me because you're not doing what I want. <sighs> it grates. It hurts. This is difficult. And Samson is getting worn down day after day. You know, if you really loved me, you would tell me, hey, look, lady, I didn't even tell my parents. Ooh, that's, that's not a good sign. Why? Scripture says, for this reason shall a man and woman, or th for this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cling unto his wife. When you get married, I know this completely breaks with Asian tradition, but when you get married, your primary responsibility needs to be to your wife, gentlemen, not to your parents. They are now a secondary responsibility. Your primary responsibility is to your wife. And he's like, no, my parents, then you. And I haven't told them yet. So why would I tell you? Not a, this is not a marriage made in heaven. This is a marriage made in H-E double hockey stick. This is not going to go well. She proceeds to weep <laughs> and cry and weep and cry for the rest of the feast. Now, I, I don't know how I could endure something like that. If my wife is mad at me for more than an hour, I'm going nuts. Okay? And she's crying and crying. Oh, Samson, you won't tell me the real Samson. Why won't you tell me? Oh, Samson, Samson, Samson. <gasps> Fine, all right. So he tells her, and then she goes and tells his people or her people. And now they can confidently go to Samson and say, we know the riddle. And they say, what is sweet other than honey? And what is strong other than a lion? And Samson knows what happened. They used his wife. But he doesn't call her his wife. He calls her his cow. This is not a good marriage. If you, didn't, if you didn't plow in my field, if you didn't use what was mine, you never would have known. All right, fine. You want your 30 gar garments? And it happened again. The spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, and he was hopping mad. He was in Timnah. Timnah is on the border between the Philistine territory and Dan. He, by himself, marches right into the middle of Philistine territory of Ascalon. Right into like one of the dead center cities of this entire nation. One of the largest cities in this entire nation. This city would have been so strong. It probably would have had its own type of military force in order to defend it. Samson walks right into the middle of it because the power of God was on him. And he beats the crap out of 30 men. One guy. Just grabs a Philistine guy. Knocks him out. Kills him, takes his clothes. Next, grabs another guy, kicks him, beats him. 30 men, he steals their clothes. And then he's so hopping mad, he's so furious after all of this, he takes all of those clothes that are beaten and bloodied back to his dad's house so he could cool off for a bit. But he is going to pay back those men for what they did. And he paid them back. By destroying 30 Philistines in the middle of one of the strongest cities of the Philistines. Question, what do you think the Philistines are going to do? Do you think they're just going to let this one Hebrew short guy like me come walking in and beat the crap out of 30 guys and go walking out like nothing is going to happen? No, the Philistines are now going to war against Samson. And God still has a part for Samson to play. 
But for now, God has got to untether him. He doesn't want him in Timnah anymore. So his new father-in-law proceeded to give Samson to his best man, his closest friend, who was supposed to be supporting him at the marriage. He's like, well, the groom is no longer here. I, we've got to marry her off. You're an eligible bachelor. Why not you marry my daughter? And so Samson is going to pay what he owes. But he doesn't have a wife anymore. What do you think God is going to do with Samson? It's about to get good. But for that, you're going to have to wait a couple weeks. How can God use someone like Samson? Someone who just turns aside and sins. Someone who's a brat to his parents. Someone who just, just destroys 30 men because he's angry. How can God use someone like that? Because God uses the situation to move Samson to where he wants him and he uses the situation to begin to change Samson's life. But here's a better question. How can God use someone like me? I've turned aside to sin. I've made horrible mistakes in my life. If God still has a part for Samson to play, God still has a part for me to play. And if God still has a part for me to play, God still has a part for you to play. He's used every situation to move me to where he wants me to be. And God's used all those situations to change my life into the tool that he wants to use. God uses broken people like Samson. God uses broken people like me. And God uses broken people like you. Let's pray. You don't think that God can use you? He can. And he will. And in some cases, it might even be without your permission. But in the majority of cases, he wants to use you because you're willing. So if you're willing to be used by God, I want you to take your hands and I want you to place them face up, your palms in your lap. And I want you to do this by symbolically saying, God, this is my life. I give it to you. Take it and use it. By keeping your hands open, you're also saying, God, this I'll receive from you anything you want. You give it to me because I'm ready and willing to be used by you. Lord Jesus, I pray for all those with their palms up, their hands on their laps, offering their life to you. God, you can change anything about us that you wanted to in a snap of your fingers but you're using the, the mistakes that we've made you're using the, the, the difficulties in our life you're using the problems that we have faced you're using even the successes of our life all to shape us and mold us into exactly what you want so Lord bring from us what you want Take from our lives what you want and give to us what you want. But Lord, please just use us. Use the willing to play a part in your plan to be used by you, almighty God, for a masterpiece. Make us the vessel into which you will pour your new wine.
In Jesus' name I pray.